Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. This is the second installment of the discrete amplifier design and build project. Although I said the videos would not be contiguous, but after getting such a positive response I figured I'd make a follow-up video right away. And yeah, I'm really impressed with the response. I was surprised. I didn't expect I'd get so many comments. A lot of comments on that video, lots of thumbs up. Lots of people said they would be interested in a kit. Other people with suggestions and things like that. So, yeah, I was really impressed with that response. There were a few questions I wanted to clear up about this project, exactly what it is. It is a single channel power amplifier board. It's not going to include a heat sink, it's not going to include a power supply, though I will give recommendations on those things. It's not going to have a preamp stage. Uh, it's not going to have tone controls and a volume control. All that stuff should be done in a preamp stage. You know, if you want a warm distortion sound added, that's where you should do that in a preamp stage. At least to me, I would like to see the power amplifier leave the signal alone. Its job is to make it larger in voltage and current for driving a speaker. It should impact the signal as minimally as possible. But like I say, if you want to do any signal conditioning and things like that, it should be done up front in a preamp or some sort of signal conditioning preamp type circuit. Uh, one guy asked me about speaker protection. You know, say the amplifier has a problem or a failure and it puts DC out to your speakers. Uh, is there a protection circuit for that? I consider that type of circuit to be external to the power amplifier board. Um, yes, if you build an amplifier, it's really recommended to have that. But being an external circuit, it's beyond the scope of this project. Now the amplifier does have current limiting, but the way current limiting works, it has to work within the amplifier circuit itself, so it makes sense to have that right on the board. Like I said, the power supply is not within the scope of this project, though I will give a recommendation to the volt amp rating of the transformer and capacitors and things like that. Now the reason for making this just a single amplifier board is because each person has their own use. You know, one person might want to make a monoblock amplifier, another person might want to make a stereo amplifier, you know, put it all in one case. Somebody might have a home theater application where they get multiple amplifiers and put them in the same case. Uh, there's just different uses and each use will require a different power supply. So, you know, it's going to be different for each person. I don't want to overcomplicate this project by making different boards for each use, different power supplies. I just want to get a decent amplifier board out there. And by the way, I did have some people ask me how they could support my channel. And I finally got around to setting up a Patreon page. And I did put a note in the description in the last video and already had three people support me on Patreon. I had Matt. Sienna, I believe that's pronounced, and Kim. So at the time of shooting this video, I had three people supporting me on Patreon, so I really appreciate that. And if you would like to support me, I will put a link in the description for that. And by the way, these notes are from the last video. If you haven't seen that video where I start, uh, kicked off this project, you might want to go back and take a look at that. Okay, so at this point I want to get into the initial calculations. I need to figure out a few things about the power supply I'm going to use with this amplifier. Okay, so now we need to do a little math. I need to know what the supply rails are going to be. It's a dual supply amp, so it needs to be fed a positive rail, a ground, and a negative rail. So what's the value of those rails? Well, if we have a 50 watt amp into 8 ohm loads, we can use this formula here, the square root of 50 watts times 8 ohms, that gives us 20 volts RMS. Well, we don't want RMS, we need to know the peak value because, you know, the supply rails is going to be somewhat beyond the peak value. 
So what we do is we take the RMS value, multiply it by the square root of 2, then I have to use a padding number here. You know, there's going to be some voltage drop, like I say, between the sine wave peak and the supply rail. And given the losses in the amplifier, it will say about 4 volts. So we run the equation, we get 32.3 volts. And that's the rail under load. Now because of the load regulation of the power supply, when it's sitting idle, this voltage will be much higher. It might be 35, 36 volts. And that's uh, plus and minus. It'll need a uh, plus 35 or 36 and a minus 35, 36 volts. Uh, but we'll look at that in more detail. But for the amplifier to put 50 watts into 8 ohms, uh, the loaded supply voltage under that condition will be 32.3 volts. So now we need to look at the type of transistors we need. What would be their current handling capability and their voltage rating? Well, if we use this formula here, square root of power over resistance, we can get current. So if I put our 50 watts divided by 8 and take the square root of that result, we get 2.5 amps. But um, this is RMS, so again, you can multiply it by the square root of 2 to get the peak. And I said, like I said, I, I break this out so you can use basic Ohm's law and power equations to figure this stuff out and you know kind of solve it in steps. So anyway, under this condition of 50 watts at 8 ohm load, the amplifier's output transistors will have to handle up to three and a half amps peak. So that gives us a baseline. Now here's the thing. I want this amplifier stable with 4 ohm loads as well. So what would that be? Well, that would be double. That would be 7 amps peak. And I even said, well, with resistive loads, I want it to handle down to 2 ohms. Well, that would be, again, double, or 14 amps. So you can see, as the load impedance decreases, well, in this case, the resistance, the current really goes up. So we'll need a fairly robust transistor. You know, something like 15 amps. Now in the real world, because the supply voltage will sag under those heavier loads, we're not going to actually get to 14 amps. It'll be somewhat less. So there's somewhat of a safety buffer in there. Okay, so what about transistor voltage? Well, you have to look at it this way. When the output is at its most positive peak, the lower output transistor, you know, this is a push-pull stage with two transistors, it's going to see from almost the positive supply rail to the negative uh, supply rail across it. So we need to make sure we have a transistor that can handle that. So, you know, we got the cats running, <laughs> the cats going crazy running back and forth. <laughs> but anyway, you know, unloaded, this is 36 volts the uh, full supply voltage across the rails would be 72 volts so we would want a transistor of at least 80 volts however we're going to use something more like 250 volts so you know no issues with the voltage rating of the transistor at all well that's that this, but this is only part of the story we have to deal with reactive loads we need to look at the transistor safe operating area because there's some gotchas there. Okay, what we're looking at now is the safe operating area curves of a 2SC 5200 transistor. I think it's 15 amps, 250 volts, 150 watts power dissipation rating. So what this graph is, it has the current on the y-axis voltage on the x-axis and you see these curves here. Well, they're actually straight lines and segments, but what's going on here is when you see these horizontal lines, this is maximum current here. Because we're not hitting a power dissipation issue at the given voltage here, you know, 10 volts and below, 
for the DC line. Now we can run the transistor at its maximum current if we wish. Now if we use an example of 150 watts uh, divided by the 10 volts here, uh, we get 15 amps, so no problem there. And by the way, there's three lines. Uh, we have one for DC, we have a 100 millisecond pulse, and a 10 millisecond pulse. So that's why the graph breaks out into three different lines. So with the DC example, uh, 15 amps times 10 volts is 150 watts, so we're right at the max. That's why you see this line break into a, a drop like this. And because these two lines are for a pulsed current, you know, they can go to a higher voltage because you know it's not continuous. This 10 millisecond line, they even show that at, I think it's about 30 amps there. Because it's such a short pulse, the transistor can handle more current. So what about the curves here? This is the maximum power dissipation limit here. So if we take 150 watts divided by any voltage on the line here, for example, if we take uh, just the 20-volt line, you see we can't go at full current anymore because we're hitting maximum power dissipation. In fact, this line should cut across 7.5 amps because, you know, 7.5 times 20 would be 150 watts. Now, you notice these lines break here into even a steeper drop. This area is called secondary breakdown. In a bipolar junction transistor, when there's a higher voltage, you know, these, these voltages are the collector to emitter voltage. And at higher voltages, current will tend to bunch into tighter areas on the die, creating hot spots. And that can damage the transistor. So we have to derate the transistor so that won't happen, so the transistor isn't damaged. Matter of fact, if you take 150 watts divided by 100, you'd expect the line to be at 100 or uh, 1.5 amps and you know if this line continued straight that's what it would cross about an amp and a half however if you look here it actually is at one-third the value only 500 milliamps and that's important because you get a 150 watt 15 amp transistor doesn't mean you can put that kind of current through it at all these conditions so you have to be aware of the maximum power dissipation and secondary breakdown conditions. And finally, the vertical line here is just the maximum voltage. It's rated 250 volts, so you know all the lines converge here because we don't want to exceed that. Well, with our amplifier, our supply voltages are low enough that we're not going to run into any issues with this transistor. And we're barely at any second breakdown. You know, that starts at uh, looks like 60 volts if it was DC. Of course, you know, the amplifier is handling AC. One transistor handles the upper part, the other the lower part, so it's going to be in pulses. So we have what I call a nice fat area to work in with the uh, transistor safe area. Still, there's another issue. Loudspeakers pose a reactive load to the amplifier's output. And you might be aware that with a reactive load, if it's inductive, the current waveform, which is dotted here, would lag behind the voltage waveform. And if it's capacitive, the current would lead the voltage waveform. And loudspeakers will, can meet all of these conditions. They could be uh, inductive, capacitive, or even resistive, depending on the frequency they're operated at. And this could be problematic for the output transistors of the amplifier if they're not sized properly. Now, resistive loads are very easy to drive. For example, if you have a, the maximum clean output signal on the amplifier, and that's at its positive peak, of course, the upper transistor here will be handling that current going into the load. Well, you have to remember the transistor is between the supply rail and the output node. And when it's at the maximum peak, there's not a lot of voltage across that. So on the safe area chart, you know, it, it might be like 4 volts. So no problem. It can handle the maximum current. The same is true when the output is at 0 volts. 
Well, both transistors now have the full supply rails across them, but there's no current flowing, so no problem there either. It would see the maximum dissipation at roughly one half the uh, peak voltage here. It doesn't quite go all the way to the supply rail, so it's not exactly at the midpoint, but now if we have a 35 volt rail, we'll, ju we'll just say 34 volts, so it's about 17. So if we have 17 volts with an 8 ohm resistive load, that's about 2.1 amps at this point, this point, and on the negative side, this point, and this point. So we end up with a kind of an odd looking instantaneous power dissipation with the transistors. So I drew that in here. And of course that would be the same on the negative side because negative current, negative voltage is the same. Now not to confuse you, this is for a resistive load. Now reactive load is a totally different story. Now, here's the problem with reactive loads. Now and we said before with a resistive load with zero voltage on the output, you know, there's maximum supply rail across the transistors. However, if you have a reactive load, the, uh, you know, the current waveform could be leading or lagging. So with that high amount of voltage across the output, then you have current. So if we, we have an amplifier, let's say we have 35 volt rails, and we have a fairly heavy current flowing, let's say it's a 6 amp current due to a heavy reactance, you know, what happens here, you know, 35 times 6, 210 watts, Ugh, Houston, we have a problem here, don't we? You know, that's way beyond our uh, transistor rating. Now that's just it. quiet. But that is just an extreme example. The good thing with most dynamic loudspeakers, you know, the kinds with the coil and magnet, is there's a very hefty DC resistance in series with its inductance. For example, a speaker rated 8 ohms nominal impedance will have a DC resistance somewhere around 6 ohms. So that 6 ohms being in series with the impedance is going to really pad that down. Normally you shouldn't encounter such an extreme example with most speakers, although there are some that are out there. It's, you know, it's very difficult to design an amplifier that's going to handle all these situations and let you drive very low impedance loads without getting into a very expensive design using multiple uh, paralleled output transistors and all that good stuff. I just wanted to bring that point to light. So at this point, I will end this segment of the amplifier design and we'll carry on in a future video. Thanks for watching.